The Auschwitz Institute was founded in the United States and in Poland in 2006. We are a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to prevent genocide and to educate governments and government officials about genocide and mass atrocity prevention. We do this through a series of training seminars and programs which take place each year in Auschwitz and other sites of mass atrocity around the globe. For AIPR, genocide is a process that unfolds over time. It's not an instantaneous event that happens overnight. Because it's a process, there are chances then, moments where we can actually change the course of events. Consequently, prevention itself is also a process with various tools, mechanisms, policies, and strategies that a society implements over time to decrease the risk for mass atrocity and genocide within their borders and to protect peoples within their societies. Many of these mechanisms are actually already employed, but they may fall under uh, different categories or different fields. Some examples include um, strengthening local protection of disadvantaged, disadvantaged groups through policy building, providing institutions for peaceful resolution of conflicts such as alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, rule of law, judicial oversight, weapons control, uh, and se security sector reform. As we think about mechanisms for greater human rights protection and peace building, genocide itself is about creating positive structures that foster social equality and justice. Human rights protection and peace building are clearly part of genocide prevention. AIPR promotes using these existing tools, but viewing every situation through a genocide and mass atrocity prevention lens to assess the effectiveness of these policies and tools in prevention. As I mentioned, AIPR educates and trains government officials through multiple programs, uh, which encompass various one-week training seminars taking place over the course of each year, mainly in Auschwitz and other sites of mass atrocity around the globe. Um, our main program, of which I am fortunate enough to be the director of, is called the Global Raphael Lemkin Seminar for Genocide Prevention. This program is co-organized with the UN Office for the Special Advisors on the Prevention of Genocide and the Responsibility to Protect, it's quite a mouthful, and the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum. To date, we have had over 200 participants from over 50 countries attending the seminar. And our participants mainly come from ministries of foreign affairs or ministries of justice, where they hold positions dealing specifically with atrocity prevention and human rights. We've also had participants come from ministries of defense, as well as military personnel. At each seminar, we have between 20 and 25 participants. And their instructors are world-renowned scholars, activists, practitioners, UN representatives, and other officials who are experts in the various fields encompassed in our training curriculums. Some examples of the modules taught in this course include bureaucratic resistance options, genocide early warning and risk assessment frameworks, perpetrator psychology, transitional justice mechanisms, the legal framework for prevention, and various case studies of mass atrocity. We employ working groups, lectures, simulations, and tabletop exercises to basically ensure very effective presentation of the material and active discussion and dialogue. The seminar is a dialogue among participants and instructors as our participants come with extensive knowledge and experience in this field. As the international community moves towards a trend uh, for prevention versus reactionary policy or interventionist methods, we have noticed that our participants are coming to us no longer as novices. They have the basic theories. They know what genocide is. They know what prevention is all about. What they're looking for are the practical application of those tools that they've learned about. How do I implement an early warning and framework in, in my domestic context. And so over the years and through our evaluation processes, we have geared our curriculum much more toward practical application of the policies and tools that we're speaking about. It is a process of shared learning in a place that bears witness to the horrors of genocide. There is really nothing quite like learning about genocide prevention in Block 12 of Auschwitz I. It is very different than learning or taking this training in Geneva or Washington, D.C. Auschwitz itself 
becomes a participant. Uh, we were speaking in our last lecture, we heard about emotions, and that's a very large part of this seminar. We utilize the power of place to give our participants an opportunity to make an emotional and physical connection to this work. It is something that we have learned over the years that fosters a commitment to this work, to these efforts in prevention long after the seminar is completed for our participants. And that's really our goal. Um, what I'm alluding to then is that the most important thing about this seminar is essentially what happens afterwards when our participants go back home to their various governmental systems. They become part of a global network of alumni working in prevention with AIPR as a facilitator of the establishment of new programs and initiatives in prevention nationally, regionally, and internationally. Our online forum to prevent is a virtual setting where our alumni can contact one another directly to form working groups or discussion groups to seek advice on domestic or regional projects and prevention that they're working on to alert other alumni of current crises or risks that are ongoing as well as AIPR posts every week a current policy paper or article about a topic, a prevailing topic in prevention to basically continue the education of our network of alumni. Also found here are all of the important conventions, legal documents, papers, and other written research on genocide prevention, as well as all of the past um, materials, readings, PowerPoints, and presentations from all of our seminars. It serves basically then as an archive or a library for our alumni and a space for them to connect directly. Aside from the virtual aspects of the network though, I, I mentioned that our alumni have spurred our work at AIPR regionally. And some of our alumni then have ex actually expressed their desire to form governmental regional networks and working bodies to tackle the issues specifically facing their countries and regions in genocide and mass atrocity. My, my colleague, Ms. Laura Collins, who is the program coordinator for the African Network for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention, another mouthful, uh, will be speaking today to you about these programs and the effectiveness of regional efforts in genocide and mass atrocity prevention. Laura? And um, good morning, everyone. And I'd just like to also um, extend my personal thanks to the ICD for the opportunity to come and speak to you today about the work of AIPR. Um, so as it's been made clear, from the point of view of AIPR, there are two key central, there are two aspects that are central um, to prevention. Firstly is the recognition that like genocide itself, um, the prevention of the crime of genocide and mass atrocities is a, is a process. It's an arduous process involving long-term engagement as opposed to temporary sporadic solutions um, to a problem. Secondly is the acknowledgement that it's primarily the responsibility of the state or um, society in question to really make preventative policies stick and moreover to integrate them really into the, the fabric of society to make them part of um, everyday life. It's without doubt that AIPR has seen the need primarily through its global efforts as detailed by Samantha the need to foster the development of governmental, regional, genocide and mass atrocity prevention programs that are really tailored to the specific needs of, of states within these regions. Moreover, it's the opinion of the IPR that the regional level is the most appropriate level um, from which to take early preventative action. And um, this is most definitely an opinion that's echoed by our alumni who have, um, as Samantha alluded to, approached us to collaborate on such regional initiatives um, in Latin America and more recently in Africa. So prior to detailing the ins and outs of our current regional initiatives, it's um, important to note that we at the Institute, at AIPR, in our capacity building for genocide and mass atrocity prevention, we don't deliver recipes, preventative recipes. Um, we don't come with a, a silver bullet. Our role as we see it at AIPR is um, to utilize our expertise and that of our extended team to educate government officials so that they themselves use the, operationalize these processes in the best way possible and suitable for their own societies and, and regions. Moreover, with regards to the overall aim of the, the network, the regional networks, 
At all stages of development, AIPR is very much at the disposal of participating states to um, aid in any way possible in capacity developing, capacity building rather, sorry, inputs and other educational modalities as requested. Um, the primary aim of all network activities, be it currently in Latin America or soon to be the case in Africa, um, will be the realisation of full self-direction of the network by individual states. We want it to be that individual states own these initiatives and we really want them to be the driving force behind their development. And this is a, a characteristic of the network that we at the Institute really see as a fundamental aspect in an effective long-term genocide and mass atrocity prevention policy at the, the regional level. So the aim that AIPR's global efforts would serve as the impetus for collaborative initiatives on the part of former participants really became a reality when a group of our Latin American participants um, spurred a meeting of 18 Latin American countries which were hosted by the Argentinian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Justice, the Brazilian Presidency, along with ourselves, AIPR. And we all came together in an intergovernmental conference that was tasked with the responsibility of uh, creating a new regionally specific genocide and mass atrocity prevention framework and also creating regionally relevant human rights abuse monitoring centres. So in Latin America it's proven to be the case that the creation of an entirely new collaborative institution um, was the most suitable starting point for a, locally, um, a local approach. Um, to genocide and mass atrocity prevention, whereas in Africa it's really proving to be the case that a collaborative, um, a collaborative approach emanating from pre-existing regional and African sub-regional bodies is, is going to be the most appropriate. Which leads me more specifically onto the, the African network for genocide and mass atrocity prevention. The African Union Commission really um, presents itself as the natural regional organisation to lead the establishment of the African Network for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention with um, AIPR, particularly given its organisational objectives, that is to say the achievement of greater unity between African peoples and nations, stability, the promotion of doc democracy, peace and security, and also of course as well as the protection of um, fundamental human rights. Moreover, given its geographical scope within the region, um, we see that partnership with AIPR, also in addition to other African sub-regional organisations, as key and the most appropriate way to facilitating the easy involvement of um, individual member countries into the African network for genocide and mass atrocity prevention. So taking both networks together, um, at the centre of the Latin American and the African network for genocide and mass atrocities is very much education. As with the global efforts, education is the, the key component. The slight difference though is that the regional networks will encompass two week-long um, training seminars, keeping the, the Polish dimension, so we'll have one week at Auschwitz in Poland, but also at another location in the respective region at a site of previous genocide and mass atrocities. Um, as I touched on, each curriculum or each curriculum um, will be tailored to the specific needs and also tackle particular issues that are relevant to the individual regions. And additionally, and perhaps most importantly, these seminars um, will act as the initial phase in a training process which has really as its end goal the national implementation of the network curriculum in localised training programmes for civil servants in each um, participating state. A second element of the network, in addition to the educational component, is very much the development of national um, action plans for the local implementation of genocide and mass atrocity prevention policies. It's important at AIPR that there is the opportunity for strong South-South exchanges between the African network and the, the already existing and functioning Latin American network for genocide and mass atrocity prevention. So too, we believe, is a collaboration with uh, local NGOs working towards similar goals. And we really see that this is something which has, in the case of Latin America, and will, in the case of Africa, be encouraged and facilitated by the, the networks. 
and for us it's really here where the success of the network will come through in the sense that both networks will be successful in so far as they produce local programs and initiatives um, that either strengthen existing national peace infrastructures or indeed create new ones. In order to achieve this, AIPR has suggested, uh, and in the case of Africa will suggest, that all member countries be tasked with identifying areas within their governmental structures where programs in genocide and mass atrocity prevention um, can and, and will be implemented. And these local programs will very much be built in cooperation with national and regional civil society actors in, in the country. And on that note, passing over to, back to Samantha, um, one she will detail one of the national programs that come under the head of, that comes under the head of the Latin American Network for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention. Thank you, Laura. I wanted to briefly give you an example of one of the national initiatives that is probably the most further, furthest uh, in development in the Latin American network, under the umbrella of the Latin American network, and that's the example of Argentina. Argentina has launched last month, actually, um, an entirely new national mechanism in the form of an interministerial body for specifically genocide and mass atrocity prevention. It derives its authority from the 1948 Genocide Convention and Argentina's obligations as a state party to this document. The national mechanism, which holds as its foundation a presidential decree establishing the body within the Argentine government, seeks to formulate a national policy on genocide and mass atrocity prevention. This mechanism involves nine institutions within the Argentine government, all of which will actively participate in national policy making on prevention. We've noticed that many of the Latin American countries that we work with, within each ministry or governmental department, there is a human rights desk. And so it's been quite logical for these, for these countries then to place a focus of genocide and mass atrocity prevention, or a mandate, if you will, on these offices. And for Argentina, these are the personnel that sit on this interministerial body. Aside from building policy, it will also serve to establish genocide prevention as a high priority on the agenda of the Argentinian government, and it will serve to facilitate the education and training of all civil servants in Argentina in genocide and mass atrocity prevention, mandatory training for all civil servants in this field. And as Laura alluded to, this is, this is the end goal of our educational component of the regional network. Um, in Latin America, which also already does have an established training curriculum. And this is Argentina's way, then, of nationalizing this curriculum within their governmental structure. Similar national mechanisms are also currently underway in Uruguay, Paraguay, Guatemala, and Nicaragua, all of which will be launched uh, next year. So this is very exciting for AIPR. Often in our work, we find that while human rights and even peace building are a priority for the governments we collaborate with, genocide and mass atrocity prevention is not necessarily specifically noted. I have said to you at the beginning of this speech that when you are building infrastructure for the protection of human rights or you are working on peace building, you are also building capacity for genocide and mass atrocity prevention. It really is about using these existing tools, structures, and policies and putting an atrocity prevention lens over it. It's not about reinventing the wheel necessarily. The Argentinian model then is a very good example of how within national systems, universal human rights are being protected with a view to preventing potential cases of genocide and mass atrocity from occurring. In conclusion, the work of AIPR is extremely long term. We have had many successes and incredible realizations uh, over the past few years that are in the short term, but really our end goals are very long term, just like the process of prevention itself. We see our organization as a facilitator, connecting people around the world with similar goals and varying expertise. We are not recipe givers, as we said. We do not instruct governments on how to prevent genocide within their borders. Genocide primarily comes from within societies and therefore must be prevented from within those societies. 
Again, our role as we see it at AIPR is to utilize our expertise and that of our extended team to educate government officials so that they themselves can operationalize these processes in the best way possible for their own societies. We then support localized approaches to genocide prevention and this methodology will always be the foundation of our work. Our alumni, our participants, the government officials themselves are the driving forces behind the development of all of our programs. We know that an approach to genocide prevention, an effective approach to genocide prevention has to be owned by the locality employing it. It has to be legitimized and developed by them. They know best. We take our cue from them. In the end, there is nothing terribly I'm done, don't worry. <laughs> in the end, um, there is nothing terribly heroic about genocide prevention in action. Generally, if you're successful, nothing happens. Um, it's very difficult to prove a negative, and there may not be much glory. Um, but it is about saving lives. At the end of the day, it's about making lives better. And as human beings, this is certainly what we must strive for. Thank you very much. <laughs>